I'm glad you are able to be with us this morning upon the first day of the week. Uh, we have a world that we live in today that is confusing. And it, it shouldn't be confusing to the child of God, and yes, sometimes it is. We forget where we are. We forget who we are. It, it's, it's easy to get swept up in the middle of everything that's going on, all the little fights and, and difficulties. And I say little fights because they are. Even though they're in the political ring, they're in the health issues of the world, they're still the little fights. We have to be reminded who we are, what we have, who we belong to. And so I want us to look at that this morning a little bit and think about the battles that we choose. In Ephesians the sixth chapter, starting in verse ten, I wanted to read through thirteen. He said, Finally be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. Stand therefore having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness of all of these things. That he tells us to, to take a look at these, this idea of looking at our spiritual self. Sometimes we have this difficulty. It is often that in these days we find ourselves in some kind of battle. And they may be legitimate battles. I'm not saying they're not. You see, as we look about ourselves today, the battle is real. It appears to be fought by many people. It seems to be a fight of honor and one worthy of cause. Now, this may be any battle that you're looking at. But as we look at these different battles, we see people on both sides that we know, possibly that we love, that are torn between the two sides. And we find ourselves and others in anxiety, fear, distraction, depressed, maybe even in failing health. Not knowing where to turn, not knowing truth, and becoming a casualty of the battle. It's very easy to become so involved in, in these battles that we see fought in this world that we become a casualty of battle. We have difficulty because we live in a world that is consumed in evil. And in darkness, living in hate, selfishness, and pride. It is often there are so many battles that we do not know what battle to fight. And often those battles are nothing more than distractions to hide that which we should really be involved in. Have we ever thought of that idea? I find myself seeing things and, and looking at things and, and thinking those things are not right. Someone needs to fight and yet how do we fight? We, we get involved in this little skirmish uh, that's a sideline over here. The skirmish of politics, and I'm not saying that they're, they're worthless pursuits. I'm saying there are more important things as a child of God. We have to be very careful. I want us this morning to take courage. I want us to listen to the word that has been given to us that we might be strong in the battle, but in the right battle, in the right battle. Go over to Luke, this battle that he talks about here in Ephesians. But I want us to go over into Luke, the ninth chapter, and take a look. Luke 9, verse 57. I want us to think about what is being said here. 
This would have been sometime in, uh, likely in the early to the mid part of Christ's ministry. There were those who were following him, those who thought they belonged to him, or maybe wanted to belong to him, I, I don't know. But he said, as they were going down the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, foxes have holes and birds have and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. To another, to another he said, Follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, Leave the dead to bury their own dead. But as far as you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. And yet another said, I will follow you, Lord, but let me first say farewell to those at my home. And Jesus said to him, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. I want us to think about what he said. I, I many, many, many years ago, I worked for a couple of men and they wanted me to list a beds to plant cotton. And I had a terrible time remaining focused before we had the GPS and all the things that they have now. You see, I could not keep focused on it and I could not do what they asked me to do. I become distracted. Things bothered me. I kept looking around. <coughs> More or less what he's saying. Quit looking for something else to do. I can remain focused on the matter of God. There should not be a willingness to turn back. There's a commitment. There should be nothing that distracts us. I have a friend who has a piece of machinery that he recently acquired or rebuilt. And, and he's been trying to or been learning to operate. And it has a degree of difficulty uh, in its operation. Something different than he's ever done before. It's one of those that you have to pay particularly close attention to because of the changing conditions that exist. And the, the, changing exist the changing conditions that exist in the soil that he's trying to move. As with all things, the day grows long as he was working and running this machine. And there were places where he found that the difficulty became increasing, it became to an increasing point. And he had to really pay particular attention. And, and then he would hit a straight run and, and become involved. His, his mind maybe began to wonder at the length of the day. He made the comment of becoming distracted and making a mess. It may not be a battle as we see it, but it's a type that leaves a good example for us to look at and compare to of what can become of one's life who becomes distracted in the battle we're in, especially as a child of God. I want us to look over into Daniel for something there that I maybe have not seen before. We know it. And so many people look at this, this story of Daniel as a kid's story because that was one of the stories that each one of us was taught as we were growing up and small. But these are things that happen to a man who was strong in God, a man who was willing to give himself to God even as a young man. And he had the willingness to not look back. I want us to think about what happened. As Babylon took captives from Jerusalem, the king had them separate the young of the royal family and of nobility, those who were without blemish. And then in Daniel 1, verse 4 and 5, he says, Used without blemish and good appearance and skillful in all wisdom, endowed with knowledge, understanding, learning, and competent to stand in the king's palace and to teach them the literature and the language of the Chaldeans. And the king assigned them a daily portion of food that the king ate 
and of the wine that he drank. And he was there to educate them for three years and be brought up. They were to be presented in service to the king. I want us to look at Daniel for a moment. This young man, along with three friends, this is Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego that we uh, read about. I'm not going to go into their situation. But I want us to pay attention to where they stood and who they followed, refusing the distractions. If we go on down in that first chapter of Daniel to verse 8 and 9, It says, but Daniel resolved that the world, or that he would not defile himself with the king's food or with the wine that he drank. Therefore, he asked the chief of the eunuchs to allow him not to defile himself. And God gave Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of the chief of the eunuchs. And, and he came to a point where he was not partaking of that food, nor were his friends, so that they might not defile their body. He, this was not just this idea of defiling them physically, but it would have defiled them spiritually. Those were things that they were to not partake of. They belonged to God. You see, Daniel didn't let those great things distract him. He didn't let those things pull him aside. He sought to stand in his battle for God and with God. And they gave him those chances in verse 17. It says, as for these youths, these four youths, God gave them learning and skill in all literature and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. At the end of the time when the king had commanded that they should be brought to the chief, brought in the chief of the eunuchs, brought them before Nebuchadnezzar. And the king spoke with them, and among all of them, none was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Meshach, Azariah. Therefore they stood before the king in every matter of wisdom and understanding, about which the queen, king inquired of them, and he found them ten times better than the magicians and the enchanters that were in all, in all of his kingdom. And Daniel was there until the first year of King Cyrus. <clears throat> I want us to understand what he's saying there. This idea that, that these young men were willing to stand firm in, in their belief, in their giving themselves to God. They didn't back up. They chose their battle to remain with God. They didn't choose to fight anyone. They cho chose to remain with God. They chose to give themselves over it. And in these things, God was with them. We find that through all of these things, Daniel served three kings and he finally came before King Belshazzar, the second king, I believe, and in Daniel, the fifth chapter, in verse 13. We have Daniel going through many different things, but in chapter 5, verse 13 and 14. He said, then Daniel was brought before the king, and the king answered and said, O Daniel, you are, the, you, you are that Daniel, one of the exiles of Judah, who the king, my father, brought from Judah. I have heard of you, that spirit of the gods. And that spirit of the gods that he's talking about, whether he understood it or not, he was saying that spirit of God which laid within Daniel. Not just gods. It was, it was a realization that something Daniel had that no one else had is in you and the light that and that light and understanding and excellent wisdom are found in you. Now the wise men and the chanters have been brought before me to read this writing and make it known to me its interpretation, but they could not show the interpretation of the matter. And so he continues to speak with Daniel. He wants him to give him that which is there. In the previous scripture before this, we see the, that those who knew Daniel knew that he was a man of God and he lived immovable in his stand in God. It withstood the episode of his friends being placed in the fiery furnace. 
in their salvation. Now the king sought to reward him for interpreting the dream. He wanted him to interpret the dream now, and he, he promised a reward, a great reward. In verse 17, let's go back just a little bit. In 16, he says, but I have heard that you can interpret or that you can give interpretations and solve problems. Now, if you can read the writing and make known to me its interpretation, you shall be clothed with purple and have a chain of gold around your neck and you shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. He's saying, I'm going to raise you up, one who is a captive, and I'm going to put you a third in place in the kingdom. There's only one man between him and the king. He was going to promise him all of these things that were so great and so grand. But I want us to listen to what Daniel said. And even though he is awarded with these things, Daniel stood firm where he was at. Then Daniel answered and said before the king, let your gifts be for yourself and give your reward to another. Nevertheless, I will read the writing to the king and make known to him the interpretation. You see, He says, O king, the most high God gave Nebuchadnezzar your father kingship and greatness and glory and majesty. This idea that, that he had Nebuchadnezzar had at least looked toward God. But this idea that Daniel was willing to, to, to say these things before the king, he, he wasn't willing to back down for what he believed. He wasn't willing to back down from where he stood. He wasn't distracted. He wasn't distracted by worldly cares. He sought only to please God. This idea to be proclaimed the third ruler. And yet as we find that he would proclaim the third ruler in the kingdom, he says Belshazzar died that very night and Darius becomes king. And we see the distractions of the world laid before Daniel once again. Great distractions. Distractions that destroy, distractions that take away, distractions that, that hurt. In Daniel, the sixth chapter, in verse 3, we're going to read a little bit of this. He says, And Daniel became distinguished above all the other high officials and satrap, sat, satraps because an excellent spirit was in him, and the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. Then the high officials and the satraps brought to find a ground for complaint against Daniel with regard to the kingdom, but they could find no ground for complaint or any fault because he was faithful and there was no error or fault was found in him. And these men said, what shall we find? What shall, we shall not find any ground for complaint against this Daniel, unless we find it in connection with the law of his God. I can't help but believe that Daniel knew that these men were against him. I can't help but believe that he, he knew of their faulty allegiance to a king, probably. They did not like Daniel. He was, he was a Jew. He was over them. Daniel didn't, didn't strive to fight them. He didn't strive to get involved in that battle. He didn't look at it. Sometimes we have difficulty when things go against us. We want to begin to try to get a hold of the things that are there. We want to try to change the situation. In verse 6, he says, Then these high officials and the satraps came by agreement to the king and said to him, O King Darius, live forever. All the high officials of the kingdom, the perfects and the satraps and the council and the government are agreed that the king should establish an ordinance and enforce an injunction that whoever makes petition to any god or man for 30 days except to you, O king, shall be cast into the lion, den of lions. Now, O king, establish the injunction and sign the document so that it cannot be changed according to the law of the Medes and the Purge, Persians, which cannot be revoked. Therefore, King Darius signed the document and the injunction. A tremendous battle, and, and Daniel could have went in, and he could have went to the king and said, well, king, look what this does. 
Daniel didn't get involved in the cares of the world. Daniel didn't become distracted of, of where he stood. Daniel didn't let those little battles bother him. He knew about the things that were happening. We find this reading in the next verse. He knew what was happening and yet he did not let them distract him. Those were political situations and he says, I'm a man of God and I stand for God. Not saying that we shouldn't run for office. It's not saying that we shouldn't strive to have a true good politics. But it's saying that Daniel refused to get involved in a fight that was destructive. He refused to get in a fight that would destroy his stance or disturb his stance in God. So I want us to listen to what he did. We go to verse 10 through 13. It said, when Daniel knew that the document had been signed, he went to his house where he, where he had windows in his upper chamber open toward Jerusalem. And he got down on his knees three times a day and he prayed and he gave thanks before his God as he had done previously. Then these men came by agreement and found Daniel making petition and plea before the God, before God. And they came near and said before the king concerning the injunction. And they told the king that Daniel was doing these things and that he refused to worship him. The king did not want to pursue this, but he had no choice. It's because of the petition that he'd signed. You see, Daniel looked and he knew what was happening. He knew what was there, and yet he remained focused on his battle in God. He stayed there and he looked and he became strong and courageous and he did what God would have had him do. He remained that one in whom the people liked and understood and wanted and yet he said, I will not bow down to anyone but God. I hear people today say, well, it's just a little thing and, and I don't have to really believe that. I can, I can. Daniel said, no. He said, I don't care what it costs. This idea, I don't care what it costs. I'm going to stand for God. I'm going to stand for God. In verses 19 of chapter 6 of Daniel. After Daniel had been thrown into the lion's den. And he spent the night. In 19, it says, then at daybreak or break of day, the king rose and went in haste to the den of lions. And as he came near to the den where Daniel was, he cried out a tone of anguish. And the king declared, O Daniel, O Daniel, servant of the living God. He knew who he was as your God whom you serve continually. You hear what he's saying? This God that David served continually. He didn't ever back down. It didn't matter the cost. Been able to deliver you from the lions. And Daniel said, O king, live forever. My God said his angel, and he shut the lion's mouth, and they have not harmed me, because I was found blameless before him, before God. He was found blameless. And also before you, O king, I have done no harm. I want us to get this idea that Daniel, no matter the consequences, no matter the situation, no matter the idea of facing death, he, he knew that God would be with him. Daniel didn't know but what he would die that night. He didn't know but what the lions would eat him. But he placed his faith in God that he belonged to him. It didn't matter. God took care of him. He's so accurate. Hebrews, the 12th chapter. We find these people had had tremendous difficulty. They had faced difficult things. They had just couldn't quite understand everything they had. But in Hebrews, the 12th chapter, 12 through 17, 
He says, therefore, lift your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees. In other words, he's talking to them that as they live for God, look to him, know that he's there. Make straight the path for your feet so that what is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather healed. Strive for peace with everyone and for, and for the holiness without which one no one will see the Lord. He says, strive towards this point, strive towards this holiness, this, this sanctification, this being set aside for God only. He says, without which no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble and by it may become defiled. Don't let the things of the world distract anyone. Don't let yourself or others that are close to you, those who belong to Christ, don't let them become defiled by the world. He said that no one is sexually immoral or unholy like Esau who sold his birthright for a single meal. For you know that after when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected for he found no chance to repent, though he sought it with tears. You see, Daniel could have taken himself and not had to face those lions. He could have bowed down to the king and said it really was not a big deal. It wasn't important and it didn't really mean it. But he didn't do it. He said, I'm going to stand for God. I'm going to live for him. Because he knew that God would take care of him. He had lived his life continually, as King Darius said. He had lived his life continually for God. He didn't let himself be distracted. He approached the battle that was given to him and he remained there. He refused to look aside. I want us to look at a few passages for just a moment that we should take great confidence in as we fight the battle of living for God. Sometimes it's difficult. Many things began to occur in our lives that strived to, drive, to, to take us away, to lead us from looking to God, to be angry with God, to feel like we're being mistreated. Or maybe Satan uses every avenue that he possibly can to distract us, to take us into a battle that is unworthy and is unuseful. In Ephesians, the fourth chapter, verses six through seven, he said, the Lord is at hand. The Lord is close. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything. Do you hear what he says? Do not be anxious about anything. Have no worry. But in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, everything. It doesn't matter what it is. He said, in everything, by prayer and supplication, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. I can't say it any plainer than he just said. Give ourselves over to God. Because it's his fight. It's through us. But he will give us those things that we need to stand strong in him. He will give us the words we need to be able to proclaim him. We go back to Hebrews a little bit in verse 12 and 1 and 2. And we've been over this in a couple of lessons. Let us also lay aside every weight and sin. Let us put those things away from us that distract us from the battle. Put them aside, set them aside, move them there. Don't look back at them. He said, which clings so closely to us and let us run with endurance. Let us keep our focus on God. Let us look to him, he says. Let us run with endurance the race that was set before us, looking to Jesus. Looking to Jesus. He tells us where we must keep focus. Focused in his word, focused in this prayer that he was talking about in Ephesians 4. 
Paul instructs and encourages the Christians of Thessalonica with a few words. In 2 Thessalonians 3.3, 3, he says, But the Lord is faithful. He will establish you and guard you against the evil one. You think about what he did for Daniel. Daniel stood firm, but he was faithful to Daniel. He established him. He guarded him against the evil one. It was in a very physical sense, but he guarded him. Then in Revelation, the second chapter, as he talks about the letter written to those in Smyrna, I want us to understand that God never tells us that we won't face difficulties. God never tells us that it's going to be an easy life. God never tells us that being a Christian will not come with great consequences in standing for him. This is what he says to the church of Smyrna in Revelation 2, verse 9 again. I know of your tribulation, this idea that God will know of our hurts, our pains, our difficulties. He said, I know of your tribulation and your poverty. But you're rich. What were they rich in? They were rich in God. And the slander of those who say that they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear what you're about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison. That you may be tested and for ten days you will have tribulation. Be faithful unto death. A guy will give you a crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who conquers will not be hurt by the second death. He says that one who conquers will have an eternity with God. We need to look very closely at our battles. We need to understand that they're there. We need to understand that there are battles that, that, that Satan uses to draw us aside, to take us from God, to remove our mind from what the real battle is. And a real battle is against those principalities of the air. Our battles are against Satan, against the evils of the world, but they're through God, not through man, through God. He says he's there to help us. He's, he belongs to us. We are his children and he is faithful. Even when we find ourselves in pain and suffering, he is faithful. Because it's he who will deliver us from that eternity in hell. He is that one who will give us a place in heaven as long as we look to him. As long as we focus on him, as long as we're faithful in him. As long as we're seeking to do his work. We live in a world that brings great turmoil. We often are drawn to a place that we do not need to be. We often find ourselves failing to look to God. He says, seek him in prayer and supplication. Is he going to take the problem away? It likely will not go away. These problems are the cares of the world. But he will give us peace in where we're at. He will help us stand and he will lead us in a way if we will remain with him, if we will seek him, if we will communicate with him in prayer and study. He will show us a way and we will win the battle as we strive to re remain faithful in God, seeking him. Thank you for being with us here this morning. I appreciate your presence so much. If you have any questions, if you want to discuss these thoughts, get a hold of me on Facebook on private message and I will be happy to talk to you, visit with you. But I thank you for being here this morning and may God bless each one of you.